Greetings and welcome to this virtual baccalaureate service. Doing things virtually is nothing new to the class of 2021. For over a year now, we live with structures imposed on our lives related to our personal and public health. And so two reflections, one on the word structures and the other on the word imposed. Reflection one, structures. The structures in which we are living and working are explicit, masks, social distance, restricted gatherings, vaccination. We can see our context. Most of the time, our context is implicit. When context is implicit, it may include positives and negatives of which we're unaware and uncritical. It has been the case that during this pandemic, explicit context, there has been a parallel social consciousness to create awareness about implicit context. One thing we might learn from the pandemic is to examine our implicit context through a lens of fairness and justice. Reflection two, imposed. In response to the structures being imposed, we could say, it's not fair, or it is what it is, or even I won't back down. Sorry, a little Tom Petty moment there. It helps me to think of the metaphor of writing a sonnet, 14 lines, 10 syllables per line, and a set rhyme structure. The structure of the sonnet is imposed on us and we express ourselves through the structure. Some may feel stifled, but this is the challenge of the day and in fact, every day. Work within the structure, not exactly. Exploit the structure. Use the structure and speak honestly, prophetically, compassionately. In this baccalaureate service, we will create community and we will acknowledge and celebrate the graduating class of 2021. And as our lives go forward, we will use the structures to bring the values of our dual education to life. A baccalaureate service is a celebration of gratitude. Gratitude is the acknowledgement of the ways in which other people share in and enrich our lives. Gratitude is a perspective that sees life in this world as a gift from a loving and creative God. Class of 2021, we give thanks for your achievement of college graduation and the promise your future holds. Even as I am encouraging you toward gratitude, I thank the individuals who are contributing to this service. We will hear from Jules president, Dr. Elizabeth McLeod Walls. The college's cardinal voices under the direction of Dr. Anthony Maglione and Mr. Blair Walker. Dr. Brendan Benz, professor of history and religion and director of the college's new center for faith and culture and your classmates. This year's baccalaureate speaker is Dr. Heather Duncan, Associate Professor of Nursing, North Park University, and a member of the William Jewell College class of 1990. My thanks to these persons and to the Jewell staff who are producing this video, and my thanks to you for sharing in this baccalaureate service. On behalf of the Jewel community, I bring greetings to you as we prepare to celebrate our 2021 graduates and to come together virtually in worship and celebration. Tomorrow morning, you, our seniors, will take the traditional last walk around the quad. You will have the opportunity to reflect not only on your college career, but in particular on the last 18 months when you lived and learned in a different way than you have throughout your lives. This experience, while challenging, created resilience and adaptability in you, and you will rely on those skills as you transition into the next phase of your lives and beyond. As you look to tomorrow, I encourage you to embrace the challenges and the opportunities, and to recognize that the emotions you experienced four years ago during your first walk around the quad, 
excitement, a little anxiety, and mainly hope for a time of growth and self-discovery are likely similar emotions to those you will experience again tomorrow. I want you to know that just as your Jewell family supported you years ago as you started your journey on the hill, we also will stand with you as you continue your journey through life. Baccalaureate service is a time of reflection before the journey, a service of hope and celebration. I invite you to join me in pausing to celebrate the person you have become during your time at Jewel. Acknowledge the profound transformation you've undergone. And above all, embrace the meaningful lives you have and will continue to nurture in the years ahead. Congratulations and blessings to you, William Jewell Class of 2021. Deo Fesis Labora. A reading from the Bhagavad Gita. Selections from the 17th teaching, three aspects of faith. Listen as I explain the threefold nature of faith inherent in the embodied self. The faith that each man has. Arjuna follows his degree of lucidity. A man consists of his faith, and as his faith is, so is he. A sacrifice is offered with lucidity when the norms are kept and the mind is focused on the sacrificial act without craving for its fruit. Honoring gods, priests, teachers, and wise men being pure, honest, celibate, and nonviolent is called bodily penance. Speaking truth without offense, giving comfort, and reciting sacred lore is called verbal penance. Mental serenity, kindness, silence, self restraint, and purity of being is called mental penance. This threefold penance is lucid when men of discipline perform it with deep faith without craving for its reward. A reading from the Old Testament the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 9 through 14, and chapter 4, verse 13. The Lord said to Moses, The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, please send someone else. A reading from the Christian New Testament, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 5 through 12. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus Christ. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. A reading from the Quran, Surah 2, verses 151 through 157. Just as we sent you to a messenger from among you who recites our revelations to you and purifies you and teaches you the book and wisdom, and teaches you what you did not know. So remember me and I will remember you, and thank me and do not be ungrateful. O oh, you who believe, seek help through patience and prayers. God is with the steadfast. And do not say of those who are killed in the cause of God dead, rather they are alive, but you do not perceive. We will certainly test you with some fear and hunger, and some loss of possessions, and lives and crops, but give good news to the steadfast. Those who, in a calamity, afflict them say, To God we belong, and to him we will return. 
Upon these are the blessings and mercy from their Lord. These are the guided ones. Please join me for a moment of prayer, a moment of contemplation as we prepare to celebrate the achievements of our loved ones, of our friends, of our students, of members of the Jewel community. We are grateful, O oh God, for the opportunity that we have had to grow with one another over the years, for the opportunity to question and to learn together, and to learn to continue to question together, for the opportunity to discover what it looks like to take joy in one another's success, to lament with one another in the face of tragedy, to take pleasure in one another's presence, and to understand the power of simply being present when words fall short. We ask that these lessons and the wisdom that they have generated remain with our graduates as they enter into the next chapter of their lives. We ask you to grant them the courage to pursue a life of love that takes seriously the position and the perspective of others. We ask that you grant them the awareness to embrace the type of humility that makes space for others. We ask that they might be motivated by faith in what might be and in hope in what has not been seen. And we ask that they continue to be conscious of the complexities of the world in which we live. For these things we pray, amen.
Hello, William Jewell. Greetings from North Park University in Chicago. I wish I could be with you in person today because as a Jewell nursing grad of 1988, I know how beautiful the hill is at this time of year. And it's a perfect time for graduation. And as faculty, I love being a part of graduation. Just the jubilation on, on students' faces and the beaming friends and family and celebrating that sense of accomplishment. And I hope you feel that accomplishment. Well done. You have earned this. Sometimes when I talk to students at graduation, they get to this look in their eye, suddenly realizing, now what? What happens now? And it's not that you want to stay in college, but the hill is comfortable. You know how to be a college student. You have the support and the community and, and that sense of belonging and familiarity. And going out into the world away from that is not comfortable. But today, I really want to urge you to lean into discomfort. Because it's in those times of discomfort that God is calling us to be who we're supposed to be. It's when he says, go here, do this. I want you to be a part of this. So how, how do we respond to God? Well, if we take a look in the Old Testament, uh, we often think of Jonah. You know, Jonah, well, it's kind of a short story. God says, hey, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah instead, instead flees, gets on a ship, gets swallowed by a fish, thrown up on the beach. God says, how about now? And Jonah says, sure, I'll go to Nineveh. I like the story of Moses. Moses, the Bible really paints this picture of Moses as a real human being, like the most human being who've ever, who's ever a human being. So you know the story of Moses. He's put in the Nile River and rescued by Pharaoh's daughter and brought up as an Egyptian, in a prince of Egypt. So we don't know about his growing up years. And the next time we see Moses is really when he's an adult. So if we take a look at our Old Testament reading in um, Exodus chapter 2, one day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. We don't know what he was thinking. We know he knows that he is here and that he's supposed to be a slave, that he was born into slavery. We don't know if he's thinking, phew, so glad I'm a prince of Egypt, or if he's trying to think, how can I help my people? But we do know he's at his wit's end. He's he can't take one more thing because he sees an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrews. And here's a point where um, the Bible gives us a glimpse into the humanness of Moses because it tells us glancing this way and that and seeing no one else, he killed the Egyptian and hid in the sand. So Moses looks like this. Anyone, anyone, anyone around? No? Okay. And murders the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. And now he is into forced discomfort. He has to flee. You're kind of in the same, but no, it's not as dramatic. You're not fleeing um, the scene of horror, I hope. <laughs> but you are being exited out of this time. You're being forced to go out into the world. Even though you want it, kind of, you don't have a choice. You have to go out. So Moses has no choice, and he heads off into the desert. We don't know how he gets to Midian. We don't know if it's um, God leads him there or if it's just by chance. It's not important to the story. So we check back in with Moses, and he has... Married the daughter of Jethro, and he has a family. Now he's still saying in chapter two, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. So he's still, he still has a heavy heart, but he's content. He has a comfortable life. He's got a loving family. He's taking care of sheep, and Egypt is far, far away. He does not have to worry about that anymore. And then chapter three and the burning bush. Now, the burning bush, let's give Moses some credit. 
He sees this bush that's on fire and not burning. And instead of running away, he says, huh, look at that. There's a bush that's on fire and not burning. I think I'll go check it out. So he goes up there and God calls out to him by name. So what would you do if God called you by name? As, as a sign from God go, goes, that's pretty clear. And God doesn't just announce himself with a burning bush and call you by name just to say hi. There's definitely something going on. He has a plan. Moses starts out pretty well. He says, here I am. And then God says, hey, I am sending you to Pharaoh, back to Egypt. You're going to save my people. And Moses is thinking, uh, what? And he proceeds in the most human way possible in a series of buts and what ifs. He basically argues with God. Moses says, who am I to do this? Okay, we'll give him a point. He's trying to be humble. And God says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. And God sa- and Moses says, uh, okay, but what if the Israelites ask me what your name is? And God says, okay, tell them I am who I am. That's my name. I'm going to make it easier for you to get back into Egypt. I'm going to be with you. I am who I am. You good to go? Moses says, yeah, what if they don't, what, what if they don't listen to me? God is thinking, okay, um, burning bush, still didn't get it. All right, fine. Signs and wonders. You can perform signs and wonders. Turn a staff into a snake. You can heal leprosy. They're going to pay attention to you. Moses switches switches tactics, tactics and gets all polite. Oh, pardon me, Lord. You know, sorry, pardon me, but um, I don't think I'm the person for the job. And God is getting a little indignant. And Moses says, you know, I, I can't talk. I stutter. I'm, I'm not the person for this job. God says, okay, fine. Take Aaron. He's your bud. He'll talk for you. I will tell him what to say. Now will you go? And Moses says, okay, I'll go. God says, finally, okay. Don't forget your staff, signs and wonders. I am who I am. Go. So how many of us can relate to Moses? How many of us don't want to go into discomfort, don't want to head into the unknown? It's not comfortable. But what if Moses had taken one look at that burning bush and run back down the mountain? What if he continued to argue with God, coming up with the what ifs and the excuses, oh, I can't do this because? What if Moses had, in the end, said, no, God, I'm not doing it. I am not going back. What would have happened? Well, God would have been God. And if he wanted to save his people, he was going to save his people. But it wouldn't have been with Moses. Moses would have been left behind to stagnate. He wouldn't have been ruined or destroyed. But he never would have become what he could have been. So what do we do? Is that comfort and familiarity necessarily a bad thing? No, it's not. We're not all prompted to return to Egypt and face some death. The trick is to identify when God is steering you to discomfort. Are you moving back home now? Are you getting married right out of college? Taking that comfortable job, is that bad? No, it's not. If you don't feel God's pointing you to something else and you aren't ignoring the burning bush or or arguing God with the, but I can't, but what ifs, then God is giving you that comfortable life. And you know what? Sometimes it is easier to being called to the big discomforts, being called to be a missionary or work with the homeless or move way far away. Those big things, they're easier for us sometimes to recognize. They're they're a burning bush. What about the little things, though? That takes more faith. 
that takes more discernment. That's when you really need to lean in to discomfort. Now, if you're living, enjoying your life, enjoying your comfortableness, not feeling that nudge of discomfort, you aren't looking hard enough. You aren't listening hard enough. Go look. What is out there that's uncomfortable right now? And how can you engage with that? Systemic racism, white nationalism in the church, social justice, fair trade, financially supporting other people. These are important, uncomfortable conversations that if we don't have, we will stack. You will stagnate. You will never grow and become the person you're supposed to be. The church will never grow into what God wants us to be. The country will not grow into what we should be. So look for those uncomfortable conversations and have them. And be willing to listen. It's uncomfortable to listen. It's uncomfortable to be wrong. Be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to say, I have no idea. I didn't know. Teach me. It's uncomfortable to listen to another viewpoint. But you know, when you listen to another viewpoint, three things happen. You change your stance, you solidify your stance, or you modify your stance. And all those are good things. Lean into those discomforts. Change, grow, listen, commit to your own change. Don't trivialize these small conversations. Without them, people will continue to leave the church. There'll be an increased discrepancy between rich and poor. Hatred of the other will continue. Sense of entitlement will continue and you will not change and grow. So being comfortable is God's gift, but it doesn't mean you live there all the time. It means you seek out discomfort and you lean in. But you know what? God doesn't tell us that we have to be alone. We don't have to be alone. Even Jesus, when he went to the garden, he took his closest friends with him for comfort. And okay, they all fell asleep. Not the best example. But if we turn to our New Testament reading in 2 Corinthians, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion. And the God of all comfort, who comforts us in trouble, so then we can go out and share that comfort with other people. He's going to give you the comfort to deal with discomfort. You're not going to do it alone. You're going to have, maybe it's a group of people. Maybe it's a sense of peace. Maybe it's something else. But you aren't going to be left alone. So lean in, everybody. As you take this time, as you get ready, you're packing your cars and ready to leave the hill, be excited to be uncomfortable because it's in those situations you're going to make a difference in the world. You're going to grow and learn and change, and it's going to be amazing. So congratulations, Jewel graduates. I'm so happy to welcome you to the family of alumni, and I hope you go forth and live that uncomfortable life.